the rectus femoris. Rectus um, is telling you that it's straight up and down, and femoris is telling you that it has something to do with the femur, and it does. So rectus femoris is actually one of your four quadriceps muscle muscles. It's the only one that crosses both the hip and the knee joint. The other three do not, or the other three uh, quadricep muscles do not. So where it originates from is the AIIS, all right, which stands for the anterior inferior iliac spine. And we'll see that on George. And then it also has a little bit, I actually just learned this um, as we were getting ready for this um, webinar. It also has an origin at the anterior aspect of the acetabulum, which is the, the fossa or the indentation on the side of the hip bone that your uh, femur uh, is going to articulate with. All right, so we'll see that on George. Uh, uh, rectus femoris is going to originate from uh, the AIIS, the anterior towards the front, inferior below something else, iliac, it's on the ilium, which is the big, big part of your hip bone, spine. It's like a, it's, it's bony, bony prominence. Spine is what that is going to come from. So there's your A. And put that on my cheek. Sorry, he's, he's kicking his feet against this box. I have my computer. <laughs> Stop, George. So this is your A SIS, your anterior superior iliac spine. It's the bony prominence on the front of your hip. The AIIS is the one that you can't really feel for because it's covered up with so much soft tissue, but it's there. You can see it. So where you see this little red splotch here, that's going to be the origin for rectus femoris. All right. Oh, did I say it crosses? Oh, and also, mm, see, I almost forgot because it's a new one in my head. Uh, ah, good, good, it good. also is going to originate from this anterior aspect of the acetabulum. Where's the acetabulum? We mentioned it last week. It's this little uh, big, deep depression that your head of your femur inserts into so that you get a really nice hip joint right there. So it's also going to have some origin from this area as well couple things you want to pay attention to. It is crossing the hip joint. No other quad muscle crosses the hip joint except for rectus femoris. And then it's also having an attachment at the front, the front of the pelvis, front of the bowl, keep that in mind. Then it travels down, it crosses the knee joint, uh, whoops, crosses the knee joint and gets itself down to the tibial tuberosity. So, tibial tuberosity, this little blue dot right here, all right, just below your patella. There. Whew. Okay, that's it. That's the fiber direction of rectus femoris. And so, this muscle does the exact opposite of the hamstrings. It does flexion, all right, at the hip joint insertions oops insertions down here all right origins up here what happens if we bring the insertion closer to the origin in this plane we call the sagittal plane all right flexion at the hip and then if we have our knee um in flexion all right what it'll do is it will pull on that tibial tuberosity in pull the knee into extension or straighten the knee all right so when i straighten the knee the insertion is coming closer to the origin up there at the hip. The other action is because it has that uh, attachment, and this is one of those, again, where it's like the rule is, is broken right now. He said usually the origin is the anchored part doesn't move. In this case, it does. It can move. It will move if we keep this um, anchor down, the insertion. We do a switcheroo. We can pull this pelvis, all right, with this muscle into an anterior all right, pelvic tilt. So just picture if I was pulling on this and this pelvis would start to tilt anteriorly. All right. Now let's talk about this hamstrings impact, or I should say the impact of sitting on the hamstrings and rectus femoris. So Jill, I'm going to ask a question here. So I want everyone to type in. Again, I know a lot of our integrative movement specialists are on the line. Thank you for being on the line. I saw Kate chime in earlier. I think Melanie is probably on as well. 
So what I want you to do is not answer because I know you guys already know the, the correct answer. Write down for me, what position is this gentleman sitting in? What position is his pelvis in? What position is his lumbar spine in? So really quick, Jill, give me the first correct answer. Uh, Jansen got it to us first. Wait Jansen, a minute. thank oh, you. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, posterior tilt. Posterior pelvic rotation. And what position is the lumbar spine in? Thank you, Jansen. And then Peggy said, also, so first one, she had posterior tilt and spinal flexion. And lumbar spine flexion. So tell me now, the second question, what structures get short and tight? Some of you already said it. Who said the short biceps femoris? Um, oh, that was over here. I got to check here. Uh, Melanie. Melanie, thank you so much. Melanie, so if the biceps as well as the semitendinosus and membranosus are getting short, Joe will show this on George in just a moment, then what structures are getting long and overlengthened? Give me the first correct answer, please. I got a rectus femoris from rectus Jansen. Femoris. Ding, ding, ding. Rectus femoris is it, yes. Awesome, thank you, Jansen, again. So I'm gonna turn the screen off here because I want Jill to show this on George. All right, so here, I got a, I got a couple, because George didn't have a re, he doesn't really a really good uh, mobile pelvis. That's one thing he doesn't have here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show it on George, but I'm also going to show it on, um, and I moved George's arm so he didn't get in the way there, um, on this, right? Ah, uh, the pelvis oh, bowl. There we go. So that's what we're going to have here. So this, so again, you look at the reason why the term pelvis got its name is that it's Latin for bowl. So pelv, P-E-L-V means bowl. So that's why they gave it this name. I didn't know and, that either. Wow. I'm, yeah. getting, I'm just getting schooled here today. Yeah, I, well, you know, like I said, I found out that there's a origin of rec fem at that anterior ac acetabulum. So you, you never stop learning, everybody. You never stop. Never and stop if you learning. do stop learning, then something's going wrong. Read a book. <laughs> so says Jill. Read a so book. Says Jill. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we said that this this back here, all right, is going to represent um, the hamstrings because we said the hamstrings have uh, attachment at the ischial tuberosity, which is the lower part. All right. When you look at the hip here, all right, you've got the lower part of the hip right down through here. Um, you've got the front of the hip, all right, up through here. So this white tape will represent the hamstrings, and this is going to represent the rectus femoris in this case, the pink tape that's towards the front. So like Dr. Osar was saying, when you start to have um, hamstrings that, and, and tell me if I'm not adding enough little information here, Dr. Osar, if you start to have the hamstrings become tight, or when you sit and you have a posterior pelvic tilt, so... So if the water spills out the back, which would happen either from like, like Dr. Ursula was saying, when you sit and you see people in that posterior pelvic tilt, cause they're kind of sitting against their sacrum, you know, how many times you do that? You don't sit on your sits bone, but you lay against that sacrum. Um, that ends up taking the hamstrings and bringing the origin closer to the insertion down towards the, the fibula, down towards the tibia. And you start to get, a shortened um, hamstring area, right? When you're in that posterior pelvic tilt, what happens to the um, rectus femoris is that it's actually going to become lengthened. So I'm going to have my hand down here be the tibial tuberosity, which is its insertion, that little bony bar part that's um, just below the patella on the tibia. And if I'm in posterior pelvic tilt, look what happens to this tape. It starts to become all right, lengthened. And when it lengthens, all right, that's one of those hip flexors there, which rect femoris is, we just said it helps to, play. it's, a, it's a, a hip flexor. Um, it's going to start to become lengthened while back here, all right, if I pull on this, notice when I start to tip it this way, all right, this is starting to be shortened up. So hamstrings get shorter in posterior pelvic tilt and the uh, rectus femoris starts to get uh, lengthened. Why does your client say to you then, why do my hip flexors feel tight if I'm actually in posterior pelvic tilt? They don't say I'm in posterior pelvic tilt because I don't know that term. But tell me, why would your client's hip flexors feel tight when Jill just said that they're over lengthened? Remember Jill says, so if you look at this, these two images here, the image here to the left of the two images, 
that's, that's quote unquote more neutral. Again, let's not argue neutral right now. Let's just say, okay, this is more neutral where the pelvis is in slight anterior pelvic tilted position where it should be. This is where you have optimal length tension between your hip flexors and your hip extensors. So that way, when you need to go more anterior, anterior, you can. And when you need to go more posterior, you can. There's a balance. The force couples around the pelvis and hip complex are working well. Now, let's talk about your older clients, your clients that have sat for most of their life. The clients, most of us, that have been trained to go into posterior pelvic tilt and lumbar spine flexion because we've been taught that anterior pelvic tilt is the crux of everyone's problems, low back problems, hip problems, knee problems. It's because you're in too much anterior pelvic tilt. So most of us have been forced into posterior pelvic tilt. What muscles get short and tight? Just to review, hamstrings. They're pulling down upon the ischial tuberosity. The glutes are, as well are pulling down on the pelvis to pull into posterior pelvic rotation. So that means that the pelvis goes posteriorly, which happens, so what happens subsequently to the hip flexors? They become over lengthened. So what does, what does your client feel? So let me stop screen sharing for a moment. So what do your clients feel when they go into posterior pelvic tilt? So what they feel is, they feel, here's your rectus femoris, you're going into posterior pelvic tilt, and now the rectus femoris is getting more taut. Exactly like you said, Galit. So what they feel is the stretching. Remember, you have your proprioceptors and your muscles and your fascia and your tendons. They're called stretch receptors. They're not called short receptors. They're called stretch receptors. So as you're shortening down the hamstrings and lengthening out the hip flexors, what does your client feel? They feel tightness because the stretch receptors are recepting receiving the signal of too much stretch. You're not sensing the shortness in your hamstrings until you bend over. Then they feel it in their hamstrings. But in standing, they feel, oh, my hip flexors always feel so tight. But we have to distinguish between short, tight, and long, tight, meaning long and over lengthened. That is why your clients are sitting, or should say, going to their physical therapist, their chiropractors, their massage therapists, and say, or to you as, as a fitness professional and saying, hey, I need to stretch and loosen my hip flexors. Whereas now, good stuff, Jansen. <laughs> now, thank you. Now you know the difference. One of the cues that we use is we want to lengthen or elongate those hamstrings. This is rotation of the entire cylinder, not just the pelvis. Because if you tell me that this caused your client low back pain, I'm going to tell you that it probably caused them low back pain because they were anteriorly rotating and creating hyperlordosis. They weren't rotating the entire cylinder. It's rotating the entire cylinder and then cueing them to lengthen through the hamstring and that posterior thigh. Okay? We breathe in. As we go up, we breathe out as we hinge forward. So this is basically we're setting up the hip hinge in split stance. The split stance is a beautiful pattern. It's our favorite go-to pattern for clients to focus on the tighter of the two sides. Yes, some of your clients have tightness on both sides, but they generally have one side that's shorter and tighter. Focus them more on the shorter, tighter side. You breathe out during the eccentric or the lengthening phase. So here's what a lot of your clients are doing. Is when they're doing this, they go out of neutral. So basically, where are they stretching the most? Where are my arrows pointing? They're stretching their low back. And they're like, oh, this really hurts my low back. I'm like, yeah, because you're not doing the exercise properly. Here's what it looks like from the side. They're going into posterior pelvic tilt and increased lumbar and thoracic kyphosis or, or curvature or flexion. And they're wondering why this hurts their low back. So you see my face like, nope, that's not how you do it. This is how you do it. Align your client. Get them to set up appropriately. Align the head, neck, and thoracopelvic cylinder. Step back. Square that pelvis up. Keep that pelvis square and then hinge. And I want you to look at that line on my shorts. That line on my shorts is a great way to look at your client. The pelvis should stay level. The TPC, that thoracopelvic cylinder, should stay aligned and controlled throughout that pattern. They should feel a tremendous lengthening in their posterior hip complex. So again, align head, neck, and thoracopelvic cylinder. Maintain that alignment. Hands on the wall. Step back, pelvis is square to the forward leg, hinge, stop right there. It's the entire cylinder rotating. It's not going into increased lordosis. It just looks that way because of how my shirt is sitting on my, on my body. 
I'm not going into increased anterior pelvic tilt. I'm just rotating the entire cylinder. And then I come back up without over squeezing. I eccentrically lengthen the hamstrings and posterior hip complex. You should feel a tremendous lengthening in that posterior hip complex. If you do not feel this in your posterior hip, your glutes and your hip rotators, you're not doing this properly. And that's how you start to get and use the length that you just created with your hip hinge. Now, once you do that, you just progress to the split stance without support. So again, this is just doing it without support, making sure you support, keep the pelvis squared up, and teach your client how to go home and make sure they maintain that rotation. You see my hands? The entire cylinder is rotating over top my forward leg. I'm not pushing the hips back. The hips are translating back a little tiny bit, but I'm rotating the entire cylinder that direction over top the femoral heads. So that's from the side and from the back, same idea. Align that head and neck and thoracopelvic cylinder. Take that extra moment to get your client set up right. Pelvis stays squared up, then rotate the entire cylinder over top the femoral heads. And again, you see the line of my shorts stays level to the floor. Make sure your clients are leveling up during this pattern, and this will change your hamstring length in one session. One session. You don't need to stretch them for weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, they probably need to do this for weeks and weeks and weeks, but one session, you'll notice a difference in their hamstring length.